Can we get your reaction to the very sad news about Sir Jeremy Hayward? I'm, I'm absolutely shocked to hear this news. It was only recently that we heard that he was um, stepping down for um, health reasons and not returning. I never worked with uh, Sir Jeremy personally, but I know many colleagues um, and colleagues in government who did, and they were all uh, in awe of his abilities. He was a very impressive individual. He was very gifted. He worked under um, many different governments, governments of all colours, and he was someone who prime ministers often looked to and trusted to get things done. He was, um, as, in the words of a friend of mine, he was an amazing person who could always find a solution to, to a tricky problem. And many of the things that have happened in this country happened because of him. It's a, it's a huge loss to the country. It's a huge loss to the government. It's very sad news. And um, our thoughts go to his family. Thank you. Um, now, of course, we'll have more on, on, on that uh, news later on in the programme. But I also do want to talk to you about... Brexit. Now, mm. you're somebody, of course, who voted <coughs> uh, to leave the European Union. Mm. Um, we can have a little look at something that you previously said. Uh, as an economic liberal, I want to see Britain trading more freely around the world. Mm. So, would you be happy then with a customs arrangement that limited Britain's ability to trade around the world? Well, the Prime Minister has repeatedly said that um, we'd be leaving the customs union. So, whatever sort of deal we get, it should be something that allows us to um, become a more global um, outlook, um, sorry, a more, you know, trading more globally with the rest of the world. And that's the outlook that we want. Um, there's reports, of course, that the, uh, the backstop, if you like, uh, is going to be an agreement uh, that the whole of the United Kingdom stays in a customs union with the EU. I mean, is that something that you would accept? Um, I think it's... I, I still think it's a... It's a... It's speculation at the moment. I don't see how, um, given the promises the Prime Minister has made, that that's something that could be on the table. Even temporarily? Uh, it, dep it depends on, on what uh, is meant by temporarily. If it's something indefinite, then ab absolutely not. So you would have to see some kind of date, if you like, in order to, to I think that's that. what I think, that, I, I think that's certainly what the government has been working to, but ideally it wouldn't even get to, get to that. Um, now, uh, moving on to other issues, um, you are somebody who said that you want to try and change the image of the Conservative Party mm. to show that it's not just about stuffy aristocrats and old Etonians. Mm. Do you think the Conservatives have an image problem? Um, yes and no. I certainly think that a lot of people have view this stereotype of us, which is not actually what we're like, and it's more about showing what the Conservative Party really is. It's people like me, it's, you know, people like my next-door neighbour, Robert Halfern, James Cleverly, Priti Patel. This is a very sort of broad, diverse um, group of people. And we are well representative of um, the vast majority of people who vote Conservative. But sadly, when, you know, when I knock on doors, people think, oh, I didn't think that Conservatives came in, uh, you know, the sort of shape and size and colour and so on. You've said that you've been mistaken for a Labour MP. Yes. It's one of the more disappointing things that tends to happen to me. And what, what, what sort of happened there, then? Um, well, I, well, I let people know that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not Labour. And, um, and I think that they are pleasantly surprised. They are, they're usually pleasantly surprised because they tend to think that um, race is such a big factor in, in how we vote. And I hope that my having this role goes some way to challenge that. Yeah, because um, there is a bit of an issue, isn't there, with BME voters and the Conservative Party? I mean, if we look at the last few elections, <coughs> in 2017, only 19% of BME voters mm went for the Conservative Party compared to 73% going for Labour. I mean, mm. why do you think it is that the Conservative Party is a turn-off for these voters? Um, there are many, many reasons. Um, some of them are historical. So if you look at the countries that many people from ethnic minorities tend to come from, emigrate from, you know, I, I, I speak as a first-generation immigrant myself, they tend to be socialist countries, so socialist politics is more normal. So we already have a huge um, barrier in, ter in terms of um, actually showing people there are other types of politics that, that you can do. So that's the first one. The second one is that other parties, Labour in particular really, Labour has been better historically at going out um, to, to you know, doing outreach with these voters, and that's something that the party's doing a lot of at the I, moment. I mean, do you think that some of the issues are the allegations, for example, around Islamophobia in the Conservative Party? I mean, the former uh, chair, Baron Darcy, <coughs> said it's very widespread, but it's being effectively ignored. I mean, is it something that the Conservative I Party needs to take more seriously? Um, I completely disagree with um, Baroness Varsi's view on that. We take every single allegation of Islamophobia seriously, and where we do find party members or people who hold um, positions in local government doing things, 
things, we, turn, we suspend them, we investigate. So why thoroughly. is it then that the Muslim Council of Britain has called for an inquiry? I don't think the Muslim Council of Britain is, um, is an organisation that would look very favourably on the Conservative Party anyway. So I think that there's probably a political motive there. When I have looked at the cases that we've talked about, I, I, I have seen strong investigations um, which have been done fairly. And there are many people in the party who are Muslims who don't recognise the allegations about Islamophobia. OK. And now, you are in charge of candidate selection. Mm. A recent report by the Forceps Society found that female parliamentary candidates are still facing barriers uh, to entry, mm. getting asked questions, for example, about what their husband thinks about them running to be an MP, about what they're going to be doing about childcare. Mm. Um, is that something that you have personally experienced or is it something that you're worried about you know, other women experiencing? Um, no, I've never had personal experience of that. And I think those things used to happen quite a while ago, but the stories still, still um, go on... Um, so you think maybe it's putting off women yes. coming forward? It, 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 it is definitely, um, it's definitely something that puts people off and we let them know that it's actually not like that anymore. But the real issue we have is women not wanting to come forward because they're worried about personal abuse, they don't like sort of the toxic atmosphere of politics at the moment. There are so many barriers that women have um, uh, in terms of coming forward. And a lot of it is actually the way that we, we approach these, um, these types of jobs. We like to think that we must be qualified or overqualified before we go for them. Men don't. And if you look at how long it takes, it typically takes a woman about two years to make the decision to do it. With the men, I say it's about 48 hours to a week. <sighs> and that alone... Um, is responsible for there being so many more men than women coming forward. Do you think so women have a harder that. time on social media, then? You were talking about the abuse earlier. Um, they, I think they, they tend to attract more attention simply because they're not as many women in politics. It's the same if you're um, an ethnic minority as well. So I have loads of followers, for instance. I have no idea you know, who they are, where they come from. They're not necessarily constituents. And then if you represent a party that's in government, people have a lot more to be angry so about. So you're saying you're getting that kind of abuse, racist, perhaps sexist abuse on social media? Um, I don't, to be honest, Sophie, I actually don't check my Twitter unless it's someone I follow. I don't see the messages. So I don't feel that way. But I know a lot of other MPs do, and quite a few have, have come off it as well. Probably quite uh, sensible. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, to sort of finish the interview, I want to talk a bit about your life, because you're not the typical uh, Member of Parliament, shall we say. Um, you used to carry a machete to school. You have to tell me a bit more about this <coughs> story. What, what was that about? Oh, yes. So this is when I... Um, grew up in this when I was living in Nigeria. I grew up in, in Nigeria and I went to a state boarding school. Most people go to, um, it's a federal government school and you have to bring in all your own equipment. We had to cut the grass ourselves. We had something called manual labour. Everyone had to do, um, you know, it's pretty hard work every day. And you cut grass with a machete. Uh, so we had, I, I think I was telling a story about how um, knife crime is more than just the availability of, um, of weapons, it's also attitudes. And I was talking about how everyone in school had a machete and we didn't use them to attack each other. Um, and there was a lot more to what was going on in terms of crime. But yes, that, that is the case. It was under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've also previously spoken about what you've uh, described as the arrogance of white men thinking they can save Africa. What, what did you mean by that? Oh, this, oh this, these are very historical quotes, Sophie. Um, it, this must have been about the mid noughties um, and I remember getting very frustrated about people, and it isn't, it isn't directed at white men, certainly not, but I do think that there is a saviour complex for people who don't actually understand very much about Africa. I mean, are you talking about people they... like Bob Geldof, for example? What you... <coughs> I'm not naming you... any names. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, not naming any names, but I do think a lot of the solutions um, to the problems in that continent need to come from that continent. I don't think it's going to be people from here who you know, can ride in on a white horse and save, um, save everybody there, and I do worry about about that saviour complex. And just finally, um, you know, when you were kind of growing up in Nigeria, you know, you've spoken about living without electricity, having mm. to fetch water in mm. a bucket from a mile away. Yeah. How do you think that experience has defined your politics now? Oh, it's at the very heart of it. And I, I think growing up in a third world country has really shaped me and makes me think about everything um, from the context of what's it like for other people and, um, and how can we make things better. So things like energy security, for example, when you've lived with blackouts, um, you get very paranoid about, you know, what are we doing? Is there going to be enough energy, enough fuel? How are we managing it? Looking at balancing that with um, dealing with issues around climate change. Um, so it affects that. It affects, for instance, how I think about um, identity politics. Growing up in a place where I couldn't stand for election the way I have now in the UK, in Nigeria, I remember talking about
talking about it with a politician from there. And why, why was that? He said, oh, well, you can't just stand, you know, where you, where you live. You have to go to, you know, where your family's from. And my grandparents are from a place that um, they, they moved away from there in the 40s or 50s, and I've never been there. And he said, that's where you'd have to go. You'd have to go to that particular town to stand for election. Whereas now I stand, um, you know, I'm elected in Saffron Walden, which was a place that I didn't have any connections to. I was a Londoner. Mm -hmm. And they just liked the interview I gave, and they said, this is the person they want to represent us. Very different from Nigeria. Completely. Saffron Walden, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> it is, it is. And yeah. I, I, think, I, I think that's amazing what we have here, that people sh don't judge you about where you're coming from, but about what you can do. Okay.